not a single person in costume. I, I, I count this. I count. I count this a fail right off the bat. I got to tell you. Okay. Um, well, we've all come as Bolsheviks. Um, okay. Comrades, in on March the fifth of this year, Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela, died. Um, and. As we all know, for the, for the sin in the eyes of international capital of refusing to prioritize uh, their agenda and for you know, cutting, slashing poverty rates and uh, rates of illiteracy and, and health care uh, um, uh, issues and so on, he was relentlessly ennonstered by the bourgeois press. He was relentlessly depicted as a kind of malevolent clown come devil um, by the, 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 the asinine bureaucrats of, um, of particularly the American media, but the global media. And one of the things that I've suggested at many meetings over many years is, is to kind of construct a kind of socialist defense of monsters. Um, and, one of the, and, and therefore, on those grounds, it is you know, uh, as, as a kind of socialist um, uh, being in solidarity with monsters, it is obviously uh, an honor to stand um, uh, against the kind of designated monster du jour. But that does not preclude criticism, obviously. And those of us in the international socialist tradition, and many others, have, uh, have, have been open in, in, with, uh, with our criticisms of some aspects of, of that regime. Don't worry, we're getting to Halloween. Bear with me. Um, <laughs> trust me. Um, you know, and we've had we've had we've we've raised issues about you know a certain rising uh, bureaucratic layer uh, uh, deals and and and, and um, standing alongside various unsavoury international figures and so on. But what I want to do here is I want to focus on on something else, a different axis of of disagreement um, with with Chavez, which is that on the 29th of October 2005, Hugo Chavez urged Venezuelan parents not to let their children dress up as witches or ghouls for Halloween. Um, he said, this is a game of terror. Families disguise their children as witches, he said, and that is contrary to our ways. What they, the US, have, have implanted here is really a gringo custom, and it's terrorism. Now, as historical missteps go, this is not up there with supporting Assad, I grant you. Um, nonetheless, one of the things I want to do today is to argue that it is nonetheless not wholly unimportant to take to th this mistake about Halloween. That Halloween, for a rigorous socialist, is worth defending. So the question here is, how do you defend Halloween from, from the left? As in standing on the left, how do you defend Halloween from the left, from others on the left? One thing we're definitely not going to do is say, well, look, it's just a bit of fun. You know, um, because as our exasperated non-political friends constantly point out, as socialists, we specialize in ruining their fun all the time. <laughs> You know, um, you know, it's like, oh, what do you mean Avatar's a racist film? Can you please, for once, stop ruining everything? Like, and no, we can't. We can't, comrades. We can't stop ruining it. And if Halloween deserves ruining, ruined it shall be. Um, so it is lucky for us that it does not, in fact, deserve ruining. So how could we defend it? Well, we could turn to issues of the rhythm of life, and we could talk about a kind of burgeoning Marxist theory of calendars, for example. And we could say that Halloween, the history of which is actually quite contested and uncertain, um, one thing that is pretty sh sure is that it, it comes out of harvest festivals in some form or other. And, and we can say that among many other things, some less savory than others, one of the things that harvest festivals were, uh, were you know, a kind of break in the drudgery of agrarian life. They were a, a, a kind of sanctified area for social relief, for play, often against the wishes of the rural elite. Uh, and that therefore, uh, as a kind of social support network with, a, with an element of joy about them, they were a kind of inadequate, mediated, contested um, precursor to, to, to a, kind of, a kind of welfare state in a very heavily mediated way, and thus just about worth defending on some levels. Now, I'll buy that, but I think we can do better than that. So, I, I, you know, I'm not here to, to suggest that we should be sort of celebrating our pagan heritage for the sake of it. If you want to do that, knock yourselves out, but that's not the axis here. I think we can do better than that. Much stronger, for a start, I think, um, is to point out the issue that I, I was mentioning about Chavez at the beginning, which is this question of 
those whom are made monsters, those who the elite make into the outsiders and the monsters, those who are traduced and, uh, and slandered as, as devil figures. And that more often than not, not always, but more often than not, a call for solidarity for, for those who are made monsters is, is something that uh, should at the very, very least get our attention. Um, and you can see this throughout history. So, you know, Chavez uh, had, a, had a concern that, you know, this was about people dressing up as witches. Um, now, you could say that in, in a certain, again, highly mediated way, this is a kind of fellowship and reclamation with the staggering number of women uh, who were traduced and tortured and terminated in a kind of frenzy of gendered spite over witch trials over the centuries, you know. Now, just as one example, um, and this is for our benefit, not sadly for theirs, it's too late for that, but it's not nothing. Okay, I'll take that. And once we start standing with the monstrous, then, you know, we're standing with, a, with, with monsters and mon monstrous made figures uh, throughout literature and history, because the disavowed throughout history, starting with Grendel being kicked out of Hrothgar's hall in Beowulf, have always had the sneaking sympathy of those suspicious of power. You know, we're the people who took the side of the, the creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, <laughs> That's better. But I think I've got a better one still, which is a very strange thing, a really peculiar uh, um, thing, which is that Halloween has become a favorite playground for the right in a, in a highly odd way. So I'm going to read you a transcript of something that Christine Romans, the CNN business um, uh, correspondent, said on Halloween in 2009. This is the most capitalist of holidays. It's about getting the most for the least amounts of work. There's a website you can find which the top five cities where the best neighborhoods are based on how rich the neighborhood is, how drivable it is, its crime rate. So you can teach your children how to get the most, the best candy with the least amount of output. I love that. Have you ever thought about teaching your kids economics lessons based on Halloween? I mean, it's really the first time they learn how to get, right? Uh, it's so American. This, this story does not have a happy ending, however. My mum took all my candy, four kids, divided it up equally and gave it back to us in equal amounts. And I was like, socialism? I didn't make up one word of that, just for the record. Um, and the weird thing is, this extraordinary approach to Halloween is incredibly common. Google socialism Halloween. There are cartoons that make this point. There are uh, websites that make this point. The, um, the odious Republican man-child clown Stephen Crowder um, has made a, did a kind of whole hidden camera trick about this, where he he took he he, he quote redistributed candy from kids trick or treating, um, and then like shot their you know upset faces to to try to prove that the sugar high of a bewildered ten-year-old is proof that humanity is at base a depraved, <laughs> bullying entrepreneur. Um, this is a very common thing, and so uh, you know. Working on the basis, um, oh, an extreme example of this, by the way, happened in Venezuela. One of the reasons probably behind what, what Chavez said was that uh, it wasn't just, you know, anxiety about witches, that um, a, a few days before, a dozen pumpkin lanterns and paper skeletons had been left around Caracas with, with anti-Chavez slogans written on them and, and little fuses to look as if they were bombs. So this is another example of, uh, you know, the even harder right saying Halloween is our playground. Now, I proceed on the basis um, that I support a campaign to deny the right wing any fun or pleasure in any arena possible. Um, and therefore, I want to take Halloween from them. Um, and therefore, one of the strongest reasons for defending Halloween from the left is out of class spite. Um, and that's good. That's a good reason. But I think there is more even still. See, the wager here is that there is something in the deep thematic structure of the festival of Halloween that we should insist is ours and we should celebrate. But if we acknowledge that, and we acknowledge that it's a contested zone and we want to take it back, then a corollary of that is that we have to say there's a right political way to do Halloween and a wrong way. And I shall be schooling those of you doing Halloween wrong <laughs> for your inadequate class politics. Um, so let's, let's look carefully about exactly what it is that, what is Chavez's critique? You know, it, it, it has three parts. This is an implanted, contrary to our ways, gringo festival. 
It's about witches, which is the unreal, and, and uh, you know, the, the kind of fantastic witches and ghouls and monsters. And it is about terror, which he then goes on to say terrorism. He starts with terror. It's a game of terror. Now, the first one of those, that this is Yankee cultural imperialism, um, is obviously a reasonable concern. Um, you know, the, the, the US culture industry specializes in, in cultural imperialism. It's very good at it. But as internationalists, you know, my starting point about the dissemination of culture across borders um, is that that is no problem per se. The question becomes what culture disseminated how to do what, to whom, by whom, um, in what circumstances. And therefore, while you might, uh, you might legitimately say that, you know, um, being at the receiving end of Halloween uh, through the kind of remorseless wedge of, of, of toy, toy, toy companies and, and, and big pez or whatever um, is, um, <laughs> is, a, is a cultural problem. But Halloween itself cannot be blamed for this and should not be blamed for this because done right, it is something that our Venezuelan comrades, like all of us, should and could happily embrace. Although not little fake bombs, obviously. That uh, is beyond the pale. Now, to move to the second of his, 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 uh, his critiques, this is the question of the unreal, the question of the fantastic, the kind of, uh, you know, um, having children dress up as, as witches and ghouls. Now, obviously, he just says this in passing, but what this is, obviously, is a, um, a position of anxiety on the left that has a history. There is a great history of anxiety about the kind of indulgence in the unreal on the left. And um, so one of the things that one's going to have to do to try and defend Halloween, to try and claim Halloween, is to have a Marxist defense of the flagrantry, flagrantly imaginary. And then the second aspect is you know, the, the Marxist defense of, of the terrifying. But to start with the, flagrant, the flagrantly imaginary, part of me wants to say, you know, do we still have to do this? really after all this time as people know this is a very old debate on the left you know i mean most famously probably lukacs's great uh, attacks on you know non-realist uh, non-mimetic art and fiction and so on um, but it has other antecedents as well nadezhda krupskaya lenin's widow and a very powerful figure in kind of publishing and uh, biblioculture in 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 the early um, uh, soviet union she in 1928 attacked uh, a very famous Russian children's book by um, Korne Tchaikovsky called The Crocodile. Um, and she attacked it on the grounds that it was bourgeois fog, guilty of, quote, distorting the facts about animals and plants. <laughs> on the grounds that crocodiles don't walk on two feet smoking cigarettes. <laughs> which is true. Um, and lest Krupskaya become a kind of foil here, I want to point out that this is not an isolated position. I mean, this was a, a, a current in Russian criticism at the time, was this enormous anxiety about these, these fantastic figures. And I think we can still see that, that the remains of that today in a certain kind of snobbery about uh, fantastic imagery. But, you know, in, in the same year, there was a book put out by very eminent critics around the same thing called um, We Are Against the Fairy Tales. Um, now, by contrast, I'm not going to argue this at much length because I suspect that most people here will already be of this, of this camp, and certainly I am. Uh, you know, I'm interested in the, the alternative tradition of Marxism uh, around surrealism and other fantastic, um, fantastic currents, which is sometimes called Gothic Marxism. And I want to offer two quick definitions of Gothic Marxism as an opposition to uh, the rather leaden literalism of, uh, of other Marxist currents. One comes from Margaret Cohen's brilliant book, Profane Illumination, about uh, Walter Benjamin, where she offers a long definition of um, Gothic Marxism, which starts off that, it, one, it is the valorization of the realm of a culture's ghosts and phantasms as a significant and rich field of social production, rather than a mirage to be dispelled. And two, it's the valorization of a culture's detritus and trivia as well as its strange and marginal practices. And she then goes on to make various other definitions which are more uh, controversial than that. Now, I would actually probably support most of them, but for, for the purposes of this talk, I'll, I'll be a sort of soft Gothic Marxist. I won't go all the way in. Michael, Michael Lurvey, talking about uh, Andre Breton, the, the Pope of Surrealism, says, perhaps one might call his a Gothic Marxism, a historical materialism sensitive to the marvelous, to the dark moment of revolt, to the illumination which pierces like lightning the sky of revolutionary action. A reading of Marxist theory inspired by Rambo, L'Autremont, and the English Gothic novel, 
without losing sight for ev even an instant of the vital need to combat the bourgeois order. And he acknowledges that this is a counterintuitive model, but it's one that he defends, uh, and I would follow him in that. So this is a kind of Marxism which stands against not just, obviously, class exploitation and so forth, but against the disenchantment of a certain kind of cold, abstract rationality. Now, the trick is to do that without falling into kind of nostalgia, um, William Morris, um, <laughs> or into a kind of, uh, into a kind of, uh, a sort of, um, kind of boosterish irrationalism, sort of celebrating, uh, you know, schizoanalysis for, quote, schizoanalysis for its own sake. Uh, this is not against rationality per se, it's against the officially mandated version of rationality that is being offered under capitalism. For me, that particular form of somewhat arid Marxism has actually bought a propaganda model of what rationality is. So it's not Marxist enough, unlike Gothic Marxism. Now this obviously dovetails, anyone who's ever heard me talk about monsters, which I do a lot, um, this dovetails with that. And that's why I'm not going to go into this much more than that, than to say, you know, I stand in the tradition of Gothic Marxism on this. But that leaves Chavez's other category, which in some ways is more difficult, which is the issue of fear and humanity and fear. So can we defend fear? One of the most famous quotes about fear comes from um, the uh, enormously important um, horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, horror writer and uh, racist and uh, all-round bad egg H.P. Lovecraft, who said, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. Now he generously he marshaled this to a particular kind of nihilism and anti uh, a, a, a kind of um, nihilist anti-humanism that I would uh, that I would want no part of. But actually, I think that's to, to grant it too much seriousness. I don't think with that slogan, what he's really basically doing is saying, Ooh. Um, <laughs> it's he's trying, you know. It, it purports to be non-fiction, but it's essentially a little piece of pantomime performance, and, and it's designed to, r to, rouse, to raise a kind of ghoulish shiver. But paradoxically, there is a way, I think, of rescuing a certain element of this notion of the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind being fear in a very mediated form. And what I'm going to try and suggest is that fear is, in fact, while it's not, it's not meaningful to think of it in terms of the oldest um, or strongest emotion, but I do think it is a foundational emotion to what it is to be human. And to understand that, we need the unique resources, not just of materialism, but of Gothic materialism, Gothic materialist Marxism. There's been an enormous amount written about, in the Marxist tradition, about, and indeed beyond, about tool use as central to sentience, central to the, to the coming into self-consciousness of you know, aware thinking animals as, as humans are. The, the, the fundamental importance of using tools um, on this, and, and you know, probably most sort of powerfully within within uh, within the tradition, uh, the, the excuse me, the tradition of Marxism is Engels' you know justly famous uh, piece, the part played by labour in the transition from ape to man, which is a, a, an outstanding piece and much much more nuanced than than than, than the detractors of Engels often in, in imply, and posits a really fascinating model of genuine feedback interaction between the, the physical body shape, tools, communication, and sentience. It's an extraordinary, very interesting piece. Um, but uh, fundamentally, the, 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 the discourse that um, you know, tools are key to sentience, of course, clearly isn't enough. And it's not enough for a couple of reasons. And most obviously, there are plenty of animals that do use tools. You know, famously, obviously, the great apes, you, you often see them uh, you know, dipping uh, like grass stems to take out ants to eat and things like that, but also crows and corvids in general. Um, many of the smarter birds use tools. Um, so what I want to say is that one of the things we have to do to kind, of, to kind of nuance the idea that tool use is central to sentience is say, well, tool use to do what for what reasons, which is surprisingly absent from the discussion tools themselves become this rather abstract category in a lot of the discussion about tool use. And to make this case, obviously, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a route down the vexed question of octopus cognition. <laughs> in 2009, 
An essay was published in the journal Current Biology, it's online, you can read it, by three biologists, Finn, Norman, and Tregenza, called Defensive Tool Use in a Coconut-Carrying Octopus. <laughs> and what they basically, the, the, the octopus, incidentally, the first invertebrate ever been clocked using sophisticated tools, and thus far the only, I believe. Um, what they basically saw, they went diving, and they saw these octopuses, these particular kinds of shallow water octopuses, picking up half coconut shells and waddling away with them. And then if they were attacked by fish, if, they were, if something came to eat them, they would use them as shields. So, you know, we, we repeatedly observe, and the thing, this is on YouTube, Google octopus and sh coconut. Um, <laughs> if I don't see a spike in Google stats in the next hour, <laughs> then I have no power. Um, so, you know, from, 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 from the essay, you know, we repeatedly observed soft sediment dwelling octopuses carrying around coconut shell halves, assembling them as a shelter only when needed. While being carried, the shells offer no protection and place a requirement on the carrier to use a novel and cumbersome form of locomotion that they call stilt walking, which you, if you look, it's a, it's a good term for it. So the point is that this is, it's a pain, it's a faff to carry around a coconut shell if you're an octopus. Um, <laughs> One of the very interesting things about this article, I think, is that the authors themselves don't realize how important it is. They don't realize how radical it is. Parenthetically, I did write them an email and say, this is, this is dynamite, and none of them ever wrote back to me. <laughs> it's almost as if I came across as crazy or something. Um, <laughs> so there's two, there's two contradictory statements they make in this, in this, in this uh, essay. First of all, they, not contradictory, but too di distinct. They say the shell is carried for future use. No, it is not. No, it is not. What they also say, much more correctly, is the only benefit is the potential future deployment of the shell. Uniquely, to my knowledge, and I stand to be corrected here, uniquely in the entire animal kingdom, other than humans, this is the only case of any animal deploying a tool in the aspiration that it need never be used. Now this is dynamite. Um, <laughs> this is fundamentally different from ant fishing. Because what you have there, you have the model, basically, uh, you know, there's various animals that have a desired outcome, they take a tool, they know what the future is. If something goes wrong, if they drop the, 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 the stick, then the future has gone wrong and they have to, they have to rethink. But it's a, it's a linear model of history. What the octopus is doing is basically, there's a quote from Gramsci, possibility is not reality, but it is in itself a reality. Now, octopuses clearly read Gramsci. <laughs> Sentience comes not with orienting towards the future with tools, but with orienting towards potentiality, towards variable futures, different futures to be negotiated. And the way this is so startlingly made clear in this example is by uh, a tool which is clearly one hopes not to have to use. This particular future is to be avoided, but you arm yourself against what is called in psychology a dreaded outcome. The dreaded outcome, which is a term that's often used in the treatment and discussion around OCD, is, I want to argue, fundamental to sentience. Because it's, it's what unlocks, it's what, it's, it's what operates as the, the copula between tools, a sophisticated brain, and the, not, not simply a sense of the future, but a sense of alternative futures, potentiality. The birth of sentience lies in the orientation to the future provoked by the mediation of tool use and anxiety. So fear is not the oldest and strongest emotion, whatever that would mean, but it is, I think, very likely highly foundational to consciousness itself, um, and therefore we should respect it. So, what we've got thus far is an argument for categories of the fantastic as being central to a, a succulent Marxist theory of modernity, and an argument that Marxist categories are central to a succulent theory of fear and consciousness, uh, um, and that therefore I think, you know, mapping, I, I think mapping the, the, the establishment of, um, of, of human consciousness historically, um, there's probably much to be, to be gained looking at cephalopods. Um, 
so we've got those two things. You know, fantasy is central to, to, to modernity for Marxism, and Marxism is central to understanding the category of, of m more specifically than fear, it's dread. Um, because it's dread of something that might be bad, but you don't quite, it is not, uh, it's not concrete. It is unknown, definitionally. So imagine how great it would be if we had a kind of grand unified theory uniting those two elements in a distinctly Marxist approach to modern rationality and political and cultural agency. Wouldn't that be great? We have such a theory. <laughs> and we have such a theory in a very, very unlikely place. In 1936, the famous, although neglected, quite brilliant, although misrepresented Marxist literary critic and poet and polymath Christopher Cordwell, uh, author of these amazing books like Illusion and Reality, Studies in a Dying Culture, um, traveled to Spain. He traveled to Spain to fight with the Republicans. He put his, 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 his life where his mouth was um, uh, and, and, and started uh, as a machine gunner where he was tragically killed scant months later uh, at, at, a, at, a, at an incredibly young age of 30, thereby you know, robbing the, the socialist movement of, 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 of uh, extraordinary work for many years to come. So that happened in 1936. In the same year, uh, a completely mainstream publisher in London called Thomas Nelson put out a collection of um, ghost stories uh, edited by somebody called Christopher St. John Sprigg called Uncanny Tales. Now, the fact of these two things happening at the same time is important because Christopher Caldwell was Christopher St. John Sprigg. The last book published in his lifetime was a collection of ghost stories collected by this Marxist militant poet, theorist, um, which he introduced, entirely mainstream collection, put out for general readers who like ghost stories, spooky tales. He collected them, he curated them, and he wrote a very short introduction that you can smuggle onto the mainstream bookshelves of any bookshop and nobody's going to think, this is Bolshevik propaganda. Um, <laughs> But he, he opens it with some startling observations. One of the things he says, he insists that the uncanny story is a modern phenomenon. He says the real cause, what he's investigating is that the real cause of the development of the uncanny story in a rational age. He uses language which is antiquated, so you know some apologies for that. But uh, the essence, I think, is very important. Quote, it may seem at first illogical that the uncanny story should be a modern development when it is precisely in modern times that supernatural apparitions and miraculous interventions are treated with the greatest skepticism. But in fact, the one follow the other as effect follows cause. If you believe wholeheartedly, I'm, I'm taking out chunks, if you believe wholeheartedly and simply in vampires, ghosts, and werewolves, as do primitive folk, they are as real people to you as your next door neighbor. The writer of the ghost story should be a rational man in contradistinction, obviously, the previous paragraph, to, to the way a ghost story works, which is that they are not as your next-door neighbor. The writer of the ghost story should be a rational man. Otherwise, he cannot build up the matter-of-fact framework which is so horrifyingly shattered by the incursion of the impossible. Any credulity would make his readers skeptical from the start, and he would underestimate the amount of preliminary mining and sapping of their confidence in the rational, which it is necessary to undertake before he shows his hand. But though he must, by habit, be a materialist, he must be one with chinks in his armor. He must be devoid of simple faith and also of completely honest doubt. In other words, he must be a typically modern writer. I think this is an extraordinary passage. And the model here of a typically modern, well, writer, person, and indeed materialist, this is being written by a materialist, by a Marxist militant who loved ghost stories. You must be a, you must be a materialist but one with chinks in your armor. And the chinks in the armor here are not a sickness to be cured. They are not a pathology to be fixed. They are constitutive of modern rationality in this model. And what is beyond them is awe and dread. Not fear of a concrete reality, but dread of an unknown. And this is where we go beyond the octopus. Because the more we understand, quote, rationally, scientifically, the more the inevitably disavowed dreadful um, becomes more and more abstract and unknowable and thereby supernatural. Octopuses will make their final leap to full sentience when they carry coconut shells against imaginary monsters. <laughs> so only with these Gothic Marxist categories can we comprehend the fundamentally dread-inflected rationality of humanity. 
The most famous other model that is, it's not a Marxist model, but it's one used quite rightly, I think, by Marxists uh, a lot, is Goya's model in, in, in the Caprichos, where he says, you know, the sleep of reason brings forth monsters. This is not a contradiction to that, that brilliant observation, but I think that it is, um, I think it is a strengthening of it. It's a sharpening of it. It brings the monsters much closer. The rational, you know, it is not now the sleep of reason that brings forth monsters. The monsters are just outside our armor, whether we're asleep or not, and they can't be banished. They are the, they're one of the fundamental things that makes us a typically modern human. And ghosts and monsters are key figures in this. So Halloween, a festival dedicated to the monstrous as a game-playing inflection of that, of that fact, and this I think is really key, that we can reflect on it and play a game with it. Be, fun to be genuinely afraid, but also turn it into play. It's not a contradiction. Children genuinely frighten themselves in their play. And this is why the attempt to bowdlerize the fearful out of children's culture is a mistake. Children like being scared, at least some of them do. So Halloween as a festival dedicated to the monstrous and a game-playing inflection of, of that monstrous is a celebration of the, uh, of the dread-inflected humans that we as Marxists are uniquely placed to understand. Now, what that does not mean is that as Marxists, as culture, we're doing Halloween right. There are many, many ways we're doing Halloween very wrong. Um, most obviously, what we're doing Halloween wrong in is the costumes. Now, anyone with any kind of social, um, social conscience of, of, at all will know about you know, the ongoing scandal of the pornification of Halloween costumes, particularly for young girls, but for women in general. Uh, and you know, if, if I was a more organized person, I would have a PowerPoint and I could show you various slides that you've all seen them. So, you know, sexy witch and you know, sexy vampire and sexy this and sexy that. And there's a very, very clear and obvious gendered, uh, um, this is, I mean, the, the sexism of this is self-evident. It's self-evident enough that it is a mainstream conversation. So that is one of, so what you have there, obviously, is, um, you know, Halloween being uh, hijacked by the, the commodification of women's bodies and uh, women's sexuality at the, um, uh, at the behest of, of, of business, which is obviously invidious and one of the main ways, ways that culture is doing Halloween wrong. Um, but while that is very important, I don't want to undermine that, I also, that, that's quite clear. I think it's quite clear to a lot of liberals, let alone a lot of us, you know. Um, this is a genuine conversation going on. Um, and I think that one of the things that I want to, um, to, to speak about is the experience of being, of coming over and seeing an American Halloween for the first time, if you're not American, because there is something uniquely wrong about American Halloween. <laughs> I remember seeing, um, you know, kids dressed up trick-or-treating, and you know, seeing a little boy dressed as a cowboy, seeing uh, a little girl dressed, I'm not, I'm not even talking about the gender axis at the moment, but, you know, seeing a little girl dressed as a, uh, as a nurse, you know, you see someone dressed as a Superman or whatever it might be. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, zombie cowboy, maybe. <laughs> Vampire nurse, you know, Superman of doom, perhaps. <laughs> I don't think you realize what a dereliction it is to have non-supernatural themed costumes at Halloween. And any of you that allow your children to do this are safe, forwardly class traitors for all the reasons that I've laid out. Now this obviously, this obviously represents, on a very banal level, the surrender to the complete and inevitable commodification of, uh, you know, of, 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 the, of the, the luddic nature of Halloween, the playfulness of Halloween. You're all enthralled to big, stupid costume. Um, and, and I deeply resent it, because what this is, this is about the domestication of dread. The whole point of the model of dread that is constitutive of human consciousness is that it is ultimately ineffable. It cannot be quite contained. And this is why it is a category error to describe slasher films as horror movies um, in the same way as, as, as supernatural or ghost, ghost movies are. Um, it's why this particular uh, tendency reaches its telos in the kind of sniggering, sadistic vacuity of torture porn films. Um, um, and 
That's what you're doing when you let your kids dress up in non-supernatural costumes. <laughs> you're complicit with that. That is the slippery slope that leads to the hegemonic domestication of the dread in humanity and the monstrous. And so I urge us as socialists to stop that. Uh, and if your children want to dress up as something non-supernatural, then I'm sorry, but, you know, sometimes we have to do things that politically we know we need to do. Um, you are going to put that Frankenstein's monster costume on, and that is the last we're going to talk about it. So I'm drawing to a close now. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly done, and I've got some... Um, perfect. And I, I, I just got a, a couple of other things I want to mention. I'm, um, we're going to, um, obviously, we're going to have a lot of time for questions and discussions and so on. And I want to be clear that there's a million different ways this talk could have gone. And I'm very happy to, for it to go off in all kinds of different directions. I'm very happy to talk in the discussion about, and to listen in the discussion about camouflage and disguises and the fact that, for example, in the UK, we have, uh, through historical contingency, we have a conjuncture of Halloween and Guy Fawkes Night. And Guy Fawkes Night is a highly politically con complicated and controversial festival uh, with all sorts of appalling reactionary elements to it around the country. But now with the Guy Fawkes, Fawkes masks becoming part of the anonymous and the, and the kind of, you know, uh, the mass movements and so on. So we can talk about Halloween on, that, on those aspects. We can talk about the history of Halloween as a sacrifice festival. Sacrifice is quite an important category increasingly in some, in some historical uh, narratives that we can go into. We can talk about necropolitics. There's a very interesting set of philosophies about the way we relate to the dead uh, uh, and some very interesting left iterations of those philosophies and obviously as a festival dedicated to the dead you know we can talk about the necropolitics of Halloween I'm very happy to talk about that I'm also very happy to simply list favorite monster movies we can go in any direction you want there is a key thing that I'm not going to talk about now but I hope we discuss and certainly I want to talk about when I when I sum up which was okay well even if you allow all of this <laughs> all of that um, what about Halloween under socialism what about Halloween under full communism you know what happens to dread post the revolution about which I have thoughts it is <laughs> traditional for a socialist to call for something at the end of a talk um, and so I guess this is socialist for monster costumes I guess um, well, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that we should be able to live up to a particular rather beautiful model of the, the oscillation of fear and play um, in, in, in a poem by the you know, famously left poet Carl Sandburg, just the, the last lines of Theme in Yellow. On the last of October, when dusk is fallen, children join hands and circle round me, singing ghost songs and love to the harvest moon. I am a jack-o'-lantern with terrible teeth, and the children know I am fooling. Not joking. He's not joking. He's fooling. And we know about the position of the fool in history that reveals truths through play. So the jack-o'-lantern can scare but still fool. So I suppose what I'm calling for ultimately is uh, come and join me in Socialists for Dread. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you.